introduce our next speaker. It will be uh, Lynn Riesar, and she is our hematology consultant. So she's an expert in treating and diagnosing anemia, and that's the topic of her talk today. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be part of this uh, program and to um, not only be part of this outstanding team of doctors, nurses, coordinators, but also to care for our wonderful patients. And I'm going to be sharing a few of those stories uh, with you today. So let's just start by defining anemia. What is anemia? Anemia actually comes from the Greek word, and please pardon me, those of you who really can speak Greek, but um, it's called anhema, which means without blood or bloodless. And so basically that means a deficient of, deficiency of the red blood cells or the hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin is the protein within the red cells that actually carries oxygen to all of our tissues and organs. And so when I'm looking at a patient, um, either with anemia or without, I look under the microscope at the red blood cells. And as you can see here, for a patient that we've successfully treated with anemia, um, let's see there, um, we see lots of red cells. And for a patient um, who has um, anemia, we see very few. And this is, of course, just a cartoon, but the real thing looks like this. So on the left, those are actual red blood cells, and they look like donuts. Um, they look like nice, big, red donuts. On the right, we have a blood smear from a patient with iron deficiency anemia. And I think from the back of the room, you may not even be able to see some of those red cells. They're so pale. They're also really small. So if you were buying a donut, you certainly wouldn't want to buy from that side, right? <laughs> um, and that's what our patient's blood looks like when they have anemia. Um, so how do we measure that? Besides looking under the microscope, we actually measure it as a percent. So we look at the percentage of the red cells to the total blood. And I'll show you a little bit more about how that's done. Um, we also can measure the amount of the hemoglobin protein there. And we use some specialized machines for that. But to help you conceptualize this and sort of get your minds around this, I want to share with you a really amazing and ingenious discovery by two uh, young women from Rice College. They actually took a salad shaker, and I'm showing a picture of that there with these two amazing young women, and they developed a way to diagnose anemia in developing countries where there's no refrigeration or no electricity and to save lives in this manner. And I've, I've worked in West Africa, and so I can appreciate um, the limited resources that many countries have. And so basically, the way this works, the salad shaker, which some of you may have used, and it's actually not, it's similar in some respects to a washer and dryer where things spin around. And what we do is we take like a small tube, really like a straw, with a little bit of blood, spin it, and then we can determine what um, the hematocrit is. And let me just show you a picture of that. So there, um, I guess it's on your right, is the tube of blood. And when the blood is spun, either in a salad shaker or in a centrifuge, which we use at our hospital, the heavier blood um, is pushed to the bottom, just like in your washer, your heavier clothes are sort of pushed to the sides. And so then you can measure that. And a normal hematocrit for an adult, um, man or woman, is somewhere around 40% or 0.4. And as you can see there um, on your left, it's only 0.2. So this is from a patient with anemia. And if you look at the fingers, they're really quite pale. And for our patients who are also deficient in iron, a very important um, nutrient in the blood, you can also get flattened nails, and the nails can sometimes crack. And anemia has been around forever. So we have examples of anemia in the literature and in art. You can see she looks a little bit pale and maybe a bit fatigued. And here actually are uh, pictures. One is a patient, and he's one of our bloodless patients, and one is a sibling. Um, and it's, it can be very challenging to diagnose. Um, if you look at these two um, adorable children, you might not be able to say who has anemia. If you look closely, if you look at his lips and his gums, they're a bit pale. And if you look at his sister, you can see how rosy and, and um, red they are. So he's actually the patient with anemia. And in fact, it was our terrific team who brought over the special tiny tubes that Dr. Frank referred to. So one of the things that we do to help our patients with anemia is when we need to test their blood, we want to use less blood. So we get teeny tiny tubes so that when we're actually trying to diagnose the anemia, what's causing it, we don't have to take quite as much blood. 
And why do we care? Why do we need to know about anemia? I think um, many of us here know that these remarkable cells actually carry oxygen. So they go into the lungs, they load up with oxygen, and they carry it to all of our tissues and organs. So the brain, the heart, our muscle, every tissue and organ um, needs this to function. And so that's really the remarkable property of red cells. Okay, so now that we know why this is important, how do we treat it? Um, well, one of the things that we can do is to give a natural hormone that's made by our bodies, made in the kidney, and it senses low oxygen. And that hormone is called erythropoietin, or EPO, and you heard a little bit about it, and um, Tammy has gotten it, and some of you in the room have gotten it. We all have um, the EPO that our kidneys make. What happens, the kidneys sense low oxygen, then they uh, synthesize this hormone, it goes to the young red, young red blood cells, and these are called reticulocytes, so they're sort of like the immature baby blood cells, and it tells them to make more red cells. And some of you probably have heard about EPO and um, have um, heard about some of the press that Lance Armstrong and many of the bikers got. And while we really can't condone using this for sports, what this has taught us is that it can very safely and very effectively build our blood. And so we're using the same hormone that, um, that he used for biking. How else can we treat anemia? Um, what else can we do to help build up blood cells and hemoglobin? Well, as I mentioned earlier, iron is one of the most important nutrients um, that our bodies need to make blood. And I think some of you who are as old as me know about Popeye, and you might remember he used to eat spinach you know, to build his muscles, but what the cartoons didn't tell us is he was also building his blood. Um, and while spinach is a vegetable with lots of iron, you know, things like red meat and fish have more. And um, because not all of us can take as much as we need, and sometimes we're losing more than we can take in, we often have to supplement that. And so we can supplement um, iron from our diets with pills and with an IV iron administration. So what does that look like? These are young red cells that are being made in the bone marrow. This is in the center of our long bones and our arms and legs. And when EPO and iron are available, they go to the young red cells, and this is a very young red cell, and they make um, uh, progeny, or, or baby red cells. This is what they look like when they're just about ready to go out into the circulation and carry um, oxygen and hemoglobin. So that's what you see. And now I'd like to share with you a real um, success story of one of our patients who's actually here today. Um, who received EPO and got through surgery safely and very successfully, in addition, of course, to Tammy, who you've heard about. So this is what um, happened when we met our patient. Um, hemoglobin was a little bit on the low side, really not what we would necessarily consider significant anemia, but for a patient who's going on a bypass um, and needs um, to have heart surgery, this is a little bit lower than what we'd like to see it. So we treated our patient with um, both iron and EPO, and these little green arrows show you that, um, and got to a very nice, comfortable um, hemoglobin that was enough to get our patient safely through um, surgery. And this slide is a little bit boring, but here I have something beautiful. Oh. <laughs> and you can see, this is after surgery and clearly successful. And I wondered if Ms. Willa Jean um, Johnson would like to stand up. She's even more beautiful person. So this is really what we're hoping for. Um, and so now, where are we going with our program? You've heard about the successes. Well, there's still work to do. And what we'd like to do, and, and we actually just put together a paper and are working on the next paper where we look at what exactly we've done to help patients like Tammy and Willa Jean. Um, how can we improve our therapies and continue to build blood cells and do this safely and effectively? In addition, we're starting to look at approaches to build other parts of our blood. We've talked about anemia too, but we all have white blood cells. They help us fight infection. We have platelets. They help clot our blood when we get cuts or have surgeries. How can we build those? And we're getting a, an increasing population of patients who have cancer and need chemotherapy. And unfortunately, many of the side effects of chemotherapy are to, um, to um, block blood production in our bone marrow. And I just saw a patient on Thursday, and we're going to be using other factors, factors similar to EPO, but in this case to build white cells and to build platelets. 
And in the laboratory, we're looking at new ways to treat cancer that won't affect the blood cells. So I think there are lots of exciting um, work to be done and a lot of excitement on the horizon that will help our patients. Because the reason we're all here today is, of course, our goal is to provide the best care possible for our bloodless patients. And actually, this is my daughter enjoying her oxygen and red cells. <laughs> so I wanted to um, say a very special thanks not only to our wonderful team who all work together to help our patients, um, but also to our patients and their families because we really would not be able to do this work without them. So, and although I'm biased and I think that all of our patients are really wonderful and beautiful people, being a scientist, I always like to provide a little bit of proof. <laughs> so there you have one of our um, gorgeous patients and her adorable little boy. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes? to uh, wait till the microphone arrives. So Isha has a microphone for you. Um, for Amelia, um, I know um, I've had a problem with it off and on for years, and I've taken iron over the counter and stuff like that. And that helps, but it sometimes it starts to make me feel, after a while I have to kind of lay back on it. So I'm looking at it more in the sense of the type of foods besides the spinach. Um, do you have a list on the site that tells you what are good iron-based foods? about the iron foods and oh. <laughs> a very good question and even though Popeye would like us to believe that spinach is really great it it has a lot of iron for vegetables but not really a lot of iron for food and Liz will share that with with you later thank you that's the microphone <laughs> yes I have a question is is this an old wives' tale? They said if you have anemia, you tend to feel cold a lot. Is that an old wives' tale? Well, some of our patients do tell us that. There are lots of reasons why somebody might be cold. Probably more often it's thyroid. Um, but occasionally we do hear that patients who are anemic can feel a little bit cold. So I think there's some truth. Like most wives' tales, there's a little bit of truth in them too. <laughs> Hi, um, how long does it take to build a person's um, red cells back up before they start surgery? Well, that can vary, and it varies um, based on the reason for the anemia. So if you have just simple iron deficiency, we can usually replete that, and our patients get a very nice response. Um, many of our patients have other issues going on. For example, if your kidney doesn't work um, completely at 100%, then no matter how much iron we give you, you will not be able to build up your blood. So in that case, we would generally use both EPO and iron. And um, if we're looking for the most, the quickest way to go, oftentimes we will do both. Um, there are also other nutrients that I didn't have time to talk about that can be deficient. And so those would need to be replaced. And again, there are different ways to give these um, nutrients. Some of them are quicker than others. And, and what we do is we individualize with our patients. So if we have a patient, we first figure out well, how quickly do they need the surgery? Is it urgent? Or do we have a few weeks or even a few months to help build up their blood? So there's lots of different approaches. They take different amounts of time. And what we try to do is take each patient and do what's best for them. Okay, well, thanks very much.